catching up to red lights and stop signs. Try to keep my head straight between these lines. Where it is I'm going, what I'm leaving behind. Out on the highway, I play this game. Well, I'm changing lanes again. With a little early scenes, to me it's all the same. I'm just trying to get ahead. Yes, and I crack the window and I feel the night go by. I'll be fine yeah. You're looking over my shoulder well, I'm calculating Just how far I look for speed drives I look for unmarked cars I check Tell this story, right? Almost forgot. Here we go. So, it's about four years ago now. I am driving down I-85 in North Carolina, minding my own business, traveling at a comfortable 70 miles an hour. By the way, the posted speed limit. suddenly realize it is not Christmas. It is March. I am being pulled over. You know, they change the speed limits all the time up there. It's 70, it's 55, it's 70 again, it's 55. We don't know what we want to do. We just want to pull you over, man. And that's what they were doing, pulling me over. Very politely pulling me over. Very large man up to the window of my car, very first thing he does, wonderful, wonderful southern hospitality sort of thing, I imagine, he invites me to sit in his car, very nice, I mean, I suppose if you don't, if you don't have a house at the time to invite somebody over to, you can just invite him over to your car, which I thought was nice of him, so, of course, I went over and I sat in his car, and I thought, oh, this is a quaint little car, and, um, as often when you're visiting somebody who you've never spent time with before, and we were visiting, I'm sure just wanted to get to be friends with me. And he wasn't saying anything, you know, he was just sort of busily writing. So I found myself awkwardly scanning the cruiser for a conversation piece. Scanning, scanning, what to say, what to say. And there I found it, glued conveniently to the dashboard in front of me, a little wooden cross turned to the man and I said, excuse me, because he was busy writing, I said, excuse me, are you a Christian man? And this guy turned to me and with all the passion and emotion of RoboCop, he said, why, yes I am. I felt our conversation take a nosedive there. And then he turned to me and he said an uh, interesting little statement. He said, you know, none of us can keep the law. Nobody can keep the law. He said, that's why I'm here. I was thinking, yeah, that's, that's why I'm here. Well, I'm calculating just how far. 
I look for speed traps, I look for unmarked cars, but it didn't help me here. I was pulled over and I was definitely getting a ticket. Well, he handed me my ticket, but before he did, he said one more thing, very interesting thing. He said, you know, nobody can keep the law. That's why there's Jesus. Nobody can keep the law. That's why there's Jesus. That's kind of an interesting thing for a state trooper to say. So he gave me my brand new ticket. I went to get out of the car. He handed me one more thing. He handed me a little track, which I honestly was kind of put off by. turned it over and he pointed on the back to his name, his address, his home telephone number, and he said to me, listen, if you're ever in Salisbury, North Carolina again, you ever need anything, you just give me a call. My home is always open. Wow, <laughs> that's pretty cool. And of course, I was thinking, look, buddy, you want to help me out? Just tear up the ticket. I don't need to come over to your house. Just tear up the ticket, man. I'll never call you. But I did not say that. I shoved that thing into my wallet, went on my way. Now, some of you have completely forgotten that I'm actually in the middle of a song. <laughs> and I've been playing these same four chords over and over and over again. And so, this story gets better, I assure you. However, I feel it upon me as a, a singer, songwriter here tonight to at least sing a little more of this song before I finish the story. Would that be okay? All right. I'm calculating just how far I look for speed traps, I look for unmarked cars I check the mirror and I bite my lip I sure hope my future is worth the trip Hey, I crack the window and I feel the night go I'll be fine How many people in here have ever gotten a speeding ticket? Uh, that's a pretty small percentage, which doesn't mean that a small percentage has gotten a speeding ticket. It just means a small percentage are honest about it. <laughs> How many people in here plan on getting a speeding ticket? You can't plan to get a ticket. That means you got to find out where the cops are and you got to speed around them. You can't plan to get a ticket. Well, anyway, if you've gotten a speeding ticket, it works pretty much uh, similar in most states. That you generally have at least two choices on how you're going to handle the ticket. You can either A, pay the fine, be on your merry way, guilty. And uh, you can choose the other option, which is B, which is go fight it, go to court. Now, being a New Yorker, I generally choose option B, because option B leaves all kinds of possibilities open. For instance, you choose option B, go to court, right? Then you got to set a court date, and then any number of things could happen. Uh, hey, a natural disaster, a huge earthquake could rip through the little town of Salisbury, destroying the courthouse, and my ticket with it. I mean, it's probably happened once in human history. So there's that possibility. There's, of course, the Southern hospitality possibility, which is, on the day of court, that they'll just be having a wonderful day in the courthouse, you know, eating grits and smiling and hugging each other, saying, y'all come back now, and you know, all that stuff. And if they're having a particularly good day, they might just say, oh, son, come here, give me a hug. 
and uh, forget about your ticket. You know, I'm sure that maybe at least one time in all of human history that has happened, and therefore, you must set a court date, which I did. So I set my court date, got a little thing in the mail, it told me my court date was in July, and it's now July, and I am in sunny Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, about three hours from Salisbury. I'm with my good friend Austin Bond, and we're planning our next few days of touring, and of course we got to go by. Salisbury for the court and my good friend Austin Bond says to me look man we should really go there tonight so that we don't have to travel three hours early in the morning to the court date but you know we don't have enough money for a hotel room you don't know anybody in Salisbury we could stay with and I said man I wish I did but I really wait a minute I think I do know somebody in Salisbury we could stay with and so I went to my wallet and I pulled out the track. I flipped it over and I dialed the number. And I waited as it rang. And a very large voice answered the line. Hello. And I said, hey, 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 hey man. You probably don't remember me. <laughs> but you wrote me a ticket once. And you told me if I was ever in Salisbury, North Carolina, I ever needed anything, I should call you. Because your home's always open. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I'm here with my friend, and I wonder if I could stay at your house tonight, because i got to go to court with you in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> and there was that awkward pause, you know, the pause that kind of lasts forever. And uh, then the little big voice said, um, come on over, man, we're having prayer meeting tonight. <laughs> so there I was. <laughs> in the home of a North Carolina state trooper, Mr. Mitch Sewell. Yep, I slept on his couch that night. I used his blow dryer in the morning. But, you know, I discovered something. Within about five minutes of being there, I discovered something shocking. Startling. Brings whole new evidence to the story discovered something within about five minutes. We got there late at night. Everybody had apparently gone home from prayer meeting and he was there alone. We got into his living room and within about five minutes it occurred to me this guy is not a state trooper. At the same time I realized that I realized that this guy was not same time, he's not a state trooper, he's not a Baptist, I realized that he wasn't a black man. See, I'm saying it weird like this because I really want you to understand what I'm saying. Within about five minutes, we got down on our knees and on his living room floor, we prayed together. A, a terrible tragedy had just come into his life and we wept together that night. We sang songs together. We embraced each other, tears running down our faces, and I opened my eyes and I looked at this guy. Totally unlike me. Totally unlike me. We have so little in common in the natural. I remember looking at him and thinking, I don't know this guy at all, and yet I feel like I've known him for my whole life. And the only way that I can explain that is that um, I suddenly realized this guy is my brother. This guy's my brother. This guy is connected to me in the deepest way. We're in the same family. Doesn't matter if we don't dress the same. Doesn't matter if our skin is the same color. Doesn't matter if we have different pastimes or different musical preferences. Doesn't even matter if we worship God in a different way. It doesn't matter. Because we are from the same family and therefore we can be really close and comfortable. Well, today, Mitch Sewell is one of my dearest friends on the planet. I just, uh, this past Sunday, I spent some time with him, and we went out to a prison, did some ministry together with a group of guys that he works with there. Of course, <laughs> being a state trooper, he put a few of them behind bars. But it's kind of cool, because now he's a full-time uh, minister, and an incredible man, a wonderful man, and a good friend. Once I was angry, I 
learned to let it go. I learned to look around me. I learned to drive a little slower now. Though I may travel the same to you all my song, well, I can hear a music. Yeah. Say enjoy the ride, and I'll be fine.